That is where we start today with some of our favorite reporters and friends. Ken Vogel is a New York Times political reporter. Here at the table, Eli Stokels, White House reporter for the L.A. Times, former chief of staff at both the CIA and Pentagon, Jeremy Bash. Elliot Williams, former deputy assistant attorney general, is here. And former Democratic Congresswoman Donna Edwards rounds out our group. Best for last, Donna. Um, let me start with you, Ken Vogel. All eyes are on... That explanation, which is expected to be included in the redacted release tomorrow of the 400-page Mueller report about how Robert Mueller either failed to or refused to or was not able to come to any sort of verdict on the obstruction question. What sorts of um, sort of signs are you looking for when that report first comes out in the morning around that question? Well, first of all, we're going to be looking at how much of that is redacted. And that's an area where I think there's a potential for there to be less redaction because so much of this stuff is sort of already out there in the public. And it will be using interviews that the Mueller team did outside of the grand jury process with White House aides to kind of contextualize what we saw happening in real time, either real time on Donald Trump's Twitter feed or real time in sort of revelation somewhat after the campaign uh, related to, for instance, the response to the Trump Tower meeting in June of 2016. And so we will both be hopefully having a lot of information to choose from, and then also uh, being able to see who was saying what, which I think will be of great interest not just to us, the reporters, but to uh, the man in the White House who yeah. is uh, uh, really interested in making sure that his, his aides around him are loyal. And so I think what they are hoping is that there will be so much uh, on other aspects of the report from, uh, you know, Paul Manafort and the investigation into him to uh, the pro-Russian Ukrainians that the, the, the focus on obstruction will be somewhat diluted and allow for the Trump folks to say no collusion, no obstruction, drive a simple message and then turn it around on the investigators and say there was bias and focus on the origins of the report and hope that the news, whatever comes out of the Mueller report, is so sort of great and diffuse that there is no clear message that, that sort of constitutes a bombshell that would uh, be averse to him. And I, I'm sure, Eli, that Ken is, is spot on in terms of what the White House is hoping for. The problem with that strategy is that's all known. It, it is already known. And we put up that poll because I think the people that are going to buy the total exoneration story have already bought it because they didn't need to see any underlying evidence. They didn't need to see the 400 page report. They heard it from the president and they already bought it. What 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 the six in 10 Americans who didn't buy that will see um, is potentially politically very damaging. Right. And this is still a political battleground. That's where this is all being fought. The president believes that this is no longer an existential crisis for his presidency. Uh, they believe the top line, no collusion, no obstruction is enough that they can take it and sell it to voters and remind people and portray the media and the Democrats issuing more subpoenas. The, the people who were working for the special counsel put this together. They can portray them all as on a politically motivated witch hunt. Uh, but when you're telling people, when you're deciding dismissing the actual report when you're saying, oh, you don't need to see that. You just need to know the top line. You know, if you're going to uh, validate Mueller's conclusion, it only makes sense that you would be OK with people looking at uh, 400 page pages of investigative materials as to how they reach that conclusion. And it's going to be uh, not a black and white picture for a lot of people. Mm. You're right to point out uh, that public opinion has really not moved. It hasn't really moved much throughout the entire presidency, as much of a roller coaster as it's been. And so I don't know that we're going to get anything tomorrow. Uh, we'll have to see. But I don't know that we'll get anything tomorrow that will dramatically change public opinion. But the president sees this. He knows it's a huge TV event. He sees the countdown clocks. He will be watching TV. He has a lot of attorneys in the White House and out working to insulate him politically, to brief him inside the White House, let him know what's coming. But he's going to be sitting watching TV and he's going to be getting that feel of what the media is seizing on, what the big takeaways are, and you'll see just how upset he is by this, by I think how much he tweets, as we usually do. He, he's going to be watching TV, said no one ever, about the last three, <laughs> to these last three presidents. Um, let, let me read you what, what we know about the obstruction report from, from the Barr summary of the Mueller report. Uh, Attorney General Barr said the report sets out evidence on both sides of the question of obstruction and leaves unresolved 
what the special counsel views as difficult issues of law and fact concerning whether the president's actions and intent could be viewed as obstruction. So it doesn't say that there's evidence on both sides of the obstruction question. It sounds like there's evidence of conduct that was clearly, I mean, the defense can't both be that he did it out loud and, and, and then the, the insulation be, well, he did it out loud. I mean, their defense is he did it out loud. Barr said we know of much of it. But on the other side will be questions of law. What, what, what does that, what will that look like in your guess? Well, first, Nicole, this is the pregame huddle right here, okay? <laughs> and, and we have to put our hands in the middle. You are. All right. yeah. And we have to uh, affirm a couple of things. One is let's avoid frames like bombshell, what's right. new. Oh, I knew that already. That can't be important because that was reported by the Daily Beast 16 weeks ago. I mean, I think we have to zoom back and take a broader look at what's happening at our at this moment in our democracy, which is a special counsel has is going to be issuing a report on the conduct of a presidential campaign, a candidate and a president, ultimately, that amounts to a heap of shameful, unpatriotic and unethical conduct where the president sought Russian interference. He received Russian interference. He benefited from Russian interference and he rewarded Russian interference. Now, whether the special counsel concluded at the end of the day that somebody like Don Jr. did not have the mental capacity. And I use that, that term specifically to commit a crime because he didn't have the intent, because he didn't understand politics. Whatever the basis for saying that a crime wasn't committed. That's important to know. It doesn't fundamentally change the trajectory of us arriving at this moment in late April of 2019, mm -hmm. where for nearly two years, the country has had, had to undergo this, this I think, trauma, yeah. a trauma of, of a, a president who, is, who has done this with with the knowledge that the Russians could have leverage over American foreign policy. Well, you know what? Let, let's, let's slow down. You, you make a great point. And I want to bring Ken Vogel in because I think he used the word bombshell because I said, what are you going to look for, Ken, when, when this first comes out? But, but, but I mean, I think that's right, Ken. And, and, and you and your colleagues and, and the Washington Post and, and you and your colleagues and every news organization has, has covered this in terms of trying to explain to our viewers and, and your readers what, what is new. But, but, but you, you put a much wiser and saner frame around this. And people keep talking about the politics of impeachment before you've even seen it. I mean, will there be any effort to put politics aside for a minute, do you think, Jeremy, and say, what are we looking at? What is this picture? And, and you know, we, we cover this as this binary thing. Mueller looked at whether there was witting, coordination and conspiracy with Russia. John Brennan testified that wittingly or unwittingly, the Russians were all over the Trump campaign aiding them. We have gone so far in terms of parsing this out, but you're right, the big picture, disturbing on every level. This began and this ends a, as a national security question. There is an intermediate criminal question, which I think the special counsel looked at very vigorously. But at the beginning, at the end, it's a question of what leverage does a foreign adversary power potentially have over the American president, the American presidency, and American foreign policy. And I think we'll learn some of that tomorrow. Whether or not the president gets a temporary bump or a temporary downgrade in the polls, I think is wholly irrelevant to our national interest. The broadest question from a national interest perspective is, how can America stay strong, stay safe, prevent this from happening again? And how can we hold the American people and Congress hold an administration accountable for it, what it did to allow Russia to have leverage over us? Ken Vogel, let me bring you back in on, on sort of this, this broader question of, of what tomorrow is and what we'll learn tomorrow that, that we haven't seen for the 22 months that Robert Mueller has been functioning in, in a pretty opaque way, other than the, the stories your news organization and others have broken about it. Yeah, I, I agree with both you and Jeremy that this, the broader picture is that this is a historical document that sort of puts all these things together, perhaps in a way that we haven't seen before. Although it's, it's important to point out that the redactions could potentially uh, minimize or, or reduce the impact of the, the, the sweep of the report. And so when I'm talking about a bombshell, I'm talking about something that comes out of it that could really drive news coverage and really get under the president's skin uh, in a way that uh, wouldn't necessarily be the case if it was the big takeaway ultimately was, yeah, this is you know a troubling pattern here, uh, a lot of which we already knew, but put it together and it says something about the way that uh, Russia intervened in our election and uh, something about the current administration and the president and his mindset and uh, the way that his team works. Um, all those things, I think, are important, 
But again, the, the way that our news cycle functions and the way that so much of this has been covered without a real big, shiny object that emerges as like the thing or maybe even a few things, you can see how this might get lost in a battle of finger pointing and, and sort of framing. And that's certainly the goal of Trump and the Trump lawyers. And the, and the view from the Democrats, it seems to be Nancy Pelosi has taken impeachment off the table. But I just reminded someone what my eight years in the Bush administration were like. The first time I turned over all my email to Henry Waxman, it was for Dick Cheney's Energy Task Force. The second time for the Valerie Plame leak investigation. The third time for the U.S. attorney scandal. And the fourth time the Pat Tillman um, investigation. Emmett Flood was the president's the White House lawyer for a couple of those, the later ones where I had already left. But there's a whole lot between answering some of these questions that Ken and Jeremy and Eli are all talking about and impeaching the president. And so as one of the attorneys who worked on the uh, Bush email, who read my emails? Uh, I read your email <laughs> and I apologize. <laughs> no, but here's no, the thing. this is but your in function. A, in a functioning, working democracy, we should have separation of powers and it's a co-equal branch of government. And frankly, that made us all better, I think. Um, uh, you know, and this whole concept of presidential harassment is a, it's sort of a disgrace and it's a way of undermining Congress's role and Congress's ability and Congress's uh, vital function in our, in our government um, of stamping out waste and fraud and abuse and just making sure our government is working better. Something I might have even said on your show before is that my former boss, Sally Yates, used to say, she used to tell us this all the time, that um, we welcome congressional oversight because it helps us do our jobs better as the United States Department of Justice. We don't want to be in a silo. So or what do they do tomorrow? What do the Democrats do tomorrow? What they, well, we'll see what's in the report. Now, remember, uh, it's not just the Democrats. Congress voted 420 to nothing to see the full report, and not even just the report, the report and the findings that, that sort of uh, led to the conclusion. So Republicans ought to be um, eager to see the... Uh, Republicans see, ought to do a lot of things. They ought to do a lot of things. Um, and of course, like I said, we're not, I mean, I hope we're still in a functioning democracy, but so many of our norms are violated and upended by this president every single day. I hope the Democrats read the report, study it, but again, and this gets back to Jeremy's point, this has all come down to this reductive question of crime or no crime, right. collusion, quote unquote, even though collusion's like Not doesn't, a crime. doesn't appear in the, in the federal criminal right. code anywhere, at least in this context. Or, um, you know, is the president mad or not? Remember the, the NBC reporting right. yesterday was, is he mad or not? What we need to be assessing is, were there violations of the public trust by a presidential campaign or by a president of the United States? That is the cancer that we need to um, at least understand what went on. We know there was obstruct an intent to obstruct. Now, you can't criminally charge it, but that's the important question here, and that's getting lost in this very, very reductive collusion or no collusion dichotomy, or I think uh, bina binary is yeah. the word that you used. It's, it's, it's more than that. It's, was there misconduct? conduct. And, we, and I think we that 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 question has been answered already. Donna, I have posited the opposite to lots of people who say, oh, you know, Trump, this is a pure political win for Trump. He, polls are unchanged. He would have said that no matter what. And if the opposite had been true, if Mueller had come out and found that he participated in a criminal conspiracy with the Russians and that he criminally obstructed justice, I'm not sure we'd be having a different conversation. It would still be politically fraught to proceed with impeachment proceedings. Jim Comey and Nancy Pelosi have already said that's off the table. The president's base would still believe what they believe, that he's programmed them for so many months. He's hardwired them to believe the whole thing was a witch hunt. Where, where do you think we are as we get ready to look at what is released tomorrow from Attorney General Barr? Well, first of all, we start with the standpoint that the 60 percent of people who want to see the report virtually tracks the 60 percent disapproval of the president. And so we know that this is pretty flatline. But I think I thought that this was never a question just of criminality, because even impeachment isn't just about uh, criminality. It is about norms of behavior and it's about a violation of the public trust, all of those things to be sure. And so I think for even for Democrats uh, tomorrow, one, digest the report. Uh, but keep in mind, this is a big piece of the puzzle that's added to that, the subpoenas that are ongoing, the oversight that's ongoing. And that isn't going to change. And I think if anything, there's that narrow slice of the electorate that wants to see and then come to a conclusion. But Trump's hard base and even
even among Democrats. Those numbers and those things are not going to change at all. But again, this is really, I mean, you know, if you look at conspiracy, one of the things that we might learn in the report is that even if it didn't rise to the level of a criminal conspiracy, there was really bad stuff going on. Mm. Even if it doesn't rise to the level of obstruction, we're not clear about that even yet. But there was really bad stuff going on that is not presidential, that is not uh, democratic. And those are all things that are important to know in any investigations that are going forward. I want to ask you about William Barr, because so far all we know about this report, and what allowed the president to brand total and complete exoneration was the Barr summary of the Mueller report. Um, my colleague Rachel Maddow covered this last night, and we're getting to it after her, of course. Um, uh, this is from Just Security. On Friday the 13th of October 1989, by happenstance, the same day as Black Friday market crash, news leaked of a legal memo authorized by William Barr. Again, 1989, folks, going back in time. Members of Congress asked to see the full legal opinion. Barr refused, but said he would provide an account that summarizes the principal conclusions. <laughs> Sound familiar, folks? When the OLC opinion was finally made public long after Barr left office, it was clear that Barr's summary had failed to fully disclose the public, the, the opinion's principal conclusions. Are we seeing a replay of that? Well, we are. I mean, and so now we know that Barr has a 30-year track record with a 19-page memo recently reinforcing that. And I think it raises some serious questions about whether Barr can be an effective arbiter of what appears in public space. And those redact, I think eventually we're going to see the entire report. It's just a matter of when. And there's a fundamental legal concept here that uh, legal analysis doesn't lend itself to a Cliff Notes version, right? And we saw this with the quote unquote, I, every time I hear the word summary, I want to you know, put air quotes around it because it's not a summary. It's not. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the Supreme Court, for instance, when the Supreme Court uh, summarizes cases, they quote the paragraphs and paragraphs and paragraphs of texts because you have to have the underlying analysis that led to it. And so when you attempt to do these sort of slapdash summaries, like, I mean, I don't want to accuse them of that, but these four page summaries of 300 page documents, you're going to run into the kinds of trouble that the attorney general sort of got himself in over the last couple, uh, couple of weeks, as we've seen. And so and remember, it was fewer than 100 words in that right. four page not summary one complete, of a 400. Not one complete sentence. Right. Ken Vogel, I, th I thought I heard you jumping in and, and I, I want to hear your thoughts on this. I, I also want to hit you with another question about Barr. He at best, at best, has a grave perception problem among the 60 percent that didn't buy the president's spin. At worst, looks very much like he's you put the Mueller release aside and, and hope springs eternal that we'll see more than we don't see in, in terms of what they release tomorrow. But by putting his finger deep into that um, a conspiracy rabbit hole of, of spies on the campaign and, and whatnot without being prepared to, to share with Congress the evidence by embracing the president's hardline immigration policies. He has made very clear that ask and you shall receive. This president wanted a Roy Cohn. He wanted someone advocating the kind of assault on law enforcement and justice that Devin Nunes and his friends in Congress have been doing. Does William Barr walk into tomorrow's release with, with a, a chink out of his armor in terms of being any sort of honest broker? I think he definitely has a target on his back from Democrats. And while the first wave, I think, of, of oversight or Democratic reaction will focus on the content of the report and figuring out if there's anything there that is, uh, you know, deeply problematic for the president or that fuels uh, ongoing lines of oversight, uh, then we're going to see uh, sort of if, the, if there is not or if the, if the uh, redactions are so extensive as to limit the ability to interpret and draw any real conclusions, then we'll see a push to get more of the report, and then I think we'll see uh, some real scrutiny of Barr, whether his characterization in this summary matches up with the findings, whether they think, whether it appears as if he put his thumb on the scale to weight it one way or the other, either in that summary or uh, in the redactions, uh, and then we'll see it move on to the already existing and sort of percolating concerns about his claims of spying, because that's sort of the next front here. The Trump, the Trump team is going to be uh, trying to turn this around and using their counter report to push a narrative that, that calls into question the very origins, or oranges, as you said, of the report and the investigation. <laughs> I didn't say it. And, the president right, said it. <laughs> that, Right. And I think and I think that Barr, uh, you know, Barr sort of gave them fodder for that by saying by by play, you know, he played into this narrative by saying there was spying. And that's something that the Trump folks want to push. So I think he's given Democrats a lot of reason to be skeptical of his ability to be an honest broker in this.
Terry. Can I just address this issue of the Attorney General referring to lawful surveillance as spying? Yeah. He knows better. Yes. And the way I know he knows better is because he told me so. Because when he was the general counsel of Verizon in 2007 and 2008, he was lobbying Congress and I was chief counsel of the House Intelligence Committee. We were engaged in a rewrite of the FISA legislation. Mm -hmm. And he was lobbying hard to say that the telecommunications companies, which have been directed to engage in surveillance, should be immune from liability. And his claim, the basis of his claim, and we had these many conversations, he and I, was that this was predicated, this was lawful, this was approved. And there's a distinction between unlawful, unauthorized surveillance and authorized and lawful surveillance. He knows better and it was irresponsible for him to say in front of Congress that what the FBI did in a national security investigation was quote spying. Eli, last word. Well, I mean, I just think that so much of what we're going to see, as we've been talking about, it's all in the eye of the beholder. Donald Trump has, he's not the, the root of this, but he has, he has come about and, and taken hold because of the, the tribalism, the division, and he's accentuated it and made it worse. And so his goal is to get everybody to see everything through a partisan lens. His goal, what, what, you know, he has now a cabinet. That's the price of doing business and working in the Donald Trump cabinet is complete subservience to a man, not to the, the, the Constitution, the balance of powers. And I think that's something that what we're talking about around this table, that's something that I think all Americans need to process and understand before they just look at everything through a tribal lens as the president wants them to do. Did my, my team win or lose? Because it is obviously much bigger than that. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.